And I want to turn to the educational implications or some of the important educational implications uh, for these broad theories of human nature. Obviously, there's a huge set of literature and a huge set of very fascinating and uh, complicated issues that philosophers, uh, theologians, uh, biologists, psychologists, and so forth uh, have to explore and have to continue to explore. But uh, as educational practitioners, when we approach our educational practice, practice deciding uh, what we're going to teach, whom we're teaching, how we're going to teach, these theoretical approaches to uh, human nature have a profound uh, implication for different practices in the classroom. And so what I want to do in this next unit is four, single out four issues uh, in which, uh, as a result of direct application, a different theoretical approach to human nature is going to lead to dramatically different approaches in the, uh, in the classroom. First issue is, uh, suppose uh, we take uh, a stereotypical example of a, uh, a problem child. Uh, the stereotypical example that I'll pick on is a seven-year-old boy uh, who is very active, very physical, and the teacher has had chronic problems with him uh, throughout the sc school year, or at least early in the school year, I suppose she doesn't let it develop for too long, with uh, his uh, staying in his uh, seat, working on the problems uh, and issues that he's supposed to be working on, not fidgeting, not letting his mind wander, not. Uh, trying to get things started by smacking the person uh, who's uh, sitting uh, in front of him, right, and so on. So we've got a standard kid uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in second grade, say. All right, how do we, as a teacher, deal with this situation? Let me just indicate how, depending on which theoretical approach uh, one has a preset toward, one is likely to deal with the situation very differently. Suppose we do it in a top-down fashion. We say, all right, suppose we take reductive materialism. I put the label up here in the graphic that we uh, developed earlier on the board here as a, as a guiding example. But suppose we put ourselves in the framework of the reductive materialist way of thinking about human nature. We are now a teacher, and we're dealing with this seven-year-old boy. Well, as reductive materialists, we're then likely to say that the problem here, the problem the child has, is a physical problem. The behavioral problems and all of the psychological uh, things are then going to be a manifestation of an underlying physical issue. We might say, well, you know, it's a seven-year-old boy, it's not a seven-year-old girl, and maybe there are big physiological differences that are going on uh, uh, between seven-year-old boys who are more prone to these kinds of things than seven-year-old girls. But essentially, it is a physical difference. Chances are good it's a chemical difference. So sort of reductive materials, we might assign a label to it. He has ADHD. Uh, he has, say, a chemical imbalance or a chemical surge or uh, some sort of biochemical thing that is going on that is making it impossible for him to sit still, stay on task, uh, and behave in the appropriate kinds of ways. Now, if that's our diagnosis of the solution, uh, of the problem rather, then our solution is fairly simply going to fall out of this. If it's a biochemical problem, then we should solve the problem through biochemical means. And so what we will do is prescribe him with certain sorts of pills uh, that will alter his uh, biochemical makeup, and then presto, right, the problem goes away. But the point just is that we are approaching this particular educational problem from the perspective of a theory of human nature, diagnosing it as reductive materialists would do. It's a material problem, and so we engage in a, uh, a material solution in this particular case. Now, by contrast, suppose we are dualists. We're a teacher, seven-year-old boy, acting up in class, right, not staying on task, right, and so forth. How are we likely to uh, diagnose the problem in this situation? Well, we would likely say things like the following. Well, clearly the problem here is that the boy's body is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. He's fidgeting, he's hitting, he's speaking up, uh, his eyes are wandering all over the place. So his body is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. But at the same time, as a seven-year-old boy, he knows what he's supposed to be doing. He knows, because he's been told repeatedly, that he's supposed to be sitting in that chair. He knows how to sit in a chair. He knows what it means to concentrate on the task at hand. So he knows what he's supposed to be doing, but his body is not doing what his body should be doing. And so the problem here is that he is not controlling himself. He is given various instructions from the teacher. He is disobeying those instructions. And so it's not primarily a physical problem, it's a psychological problem. This boy has not chosen to 
concentrate, to stay focused, to do what he has been ordered to do by the teachers. And so it's a moral problem. The, the child is being disobedient uh, 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 psychologically here, and so we have to deal with it in terms of a psychological disobedience or a moral disobedience, and perhaps some form of punishment right, is appropriate uh, to give the guy the proper motivation to uh, have his psychological side, uh, his, his mind control his body in the appropriate kind of fashion. So again, the idea here is exact same problem as we were uh, dealing with earlier, but a very different diagnosis, very different approach to the, to the problem. Is it a chemical issue that we deal with chemically, or is it a moral disobedience issue and we deal with it psychologically and, uh, and morally? All right, suppose by contrast we are integrationists and we're dealing again with this uh, seven-year-old boy. He's not staying on task in class. So physically, right, he's not engaged with and in, you know, doing the appropriate kinds of behaviors. Why is his body then disengaged from the tasks at hand? Chances are we would then say, well, it must be also because psychologically he is disengaged from the task at hand. If we want his body to be on task, then we also have to have his mind on task. If we want his body focused, we have to get his mind focused. How do we get people focused so that physically and psychologically they are in the zone and focused on the things that they're supposed to be doing. Well, uh, according to the integrationist approach, motivation is going to be a huge part of it here. And so our diagnosis might be that our mind, or sorry, our body is, uh, is not motivated or moving in the right direction because our psychology, the seven-year-old boy, is not motivated in the right direction. He's bored, he's not interested. Why he should be doing that question has not been answered to his satisfaction. If we're integrationists, we're less likely to go with the reductionist solution and say, well, we just need to give him a pill so that he can uh, uh, stay on task. We might, might notice, for example, that the same seven-year-old boy, if you put him in front of a video game and give him the controller, he has absolutely no problem staying on task. It's not the case that he has a chemical imbalance in his brain. If he's interested in something, he will focus on it. He will play the video game and do all of the appropriate kinds of moves and solve the problems and move on to the next level and be enjoying it for an hour, for two hours, Hours until his mom says you have to stop and come to dinner right now. So it's not a, psycho, a chemical problem. It's not that the kid is a bad kid. It's that the kid is not motivated. Maybe I am a boring teacher. Maybe I just haven't set up the issue and motivated it in a way that connects to the student's values. And so if I want to get the kids physically and psychologically engaged with this material, perhaps what I need to do is spend more time properly motivating and setting the context for the problem so that the child is then psychologically engaged and then as a result of that, he will become physically engaged. So, do we moralize the issue? Do we see it as an issue of, of uh, motivational psychology? Do we see it as an issue of physical imbalance? Now, we might say all of these things can occur on different situations. Sometimes it is a moral problem. Sometimes it is a chemical imbalance. Sometimes it is a, a motivational issue. The question is going to be, what's our general approach to these? What, uh, what's our bias going to be or our set? Which kinds of diagnoses are we first going to try and work through before we say, all right, that's not working, we move on to, to the other one. Dualism, reductive materialism, and integrationism lead teachers uh, when they're dealing with their students to deal with the, those kinds of classroom management problems very differently and enact typically very different strategies.